man who wouldn't take yes for an answer. Okay? And to me, Doug North is exactly that man, because despite all his accomplishments, he never really rested on his laurels. And that's Doug with his second wife, Elizabeth Cates, shortly before he passed away. He co-founded two influential schools of economic thought. He edited a prestigious journal in economics, the Journal of Economic History. He won the Nobel Prize in economics, right? But even after all these accomplishments, he was always pushing for a better theory, a better understanding. He was never satisfied with, with what he had done and what he had learned. He always thought there was a problem. I have a really good friend, Tyler Cowan, who claims his, one of his maxims is there's something wrong with everything. And Doug believed that even about his own work, and he was always trying to improve it and to refine it. One of Doug's collaborators, students and collaborators, was J.J. Wallace, and J.J. put it this way, North's genius is figuring out what question to ask next, and that often comes as an answer to the question, what can't I currently explain in my current conceptual framework? This requires a very unusual combination of humility and confidence. Right? Humility to be able to say, I haven't got it right. I don't, you know, so many academics, when they write something down and get it published, they'll spend the rest of their lives defending it. Right? This is what I wrote. This has to be right. Sometimes academics will spend the rest of their lives defending some dead guy. Right? There are tons of people who will defend everything John Maynard Keynes ever said as being correct. There are people on the other side who will defend everything Ludwig von Mises ever said as being correct. Right? Doug always knew he was falling short of what he wanted to do and always, uh, always wanted to get better. He really wanted to make the world a better place. The Nobel Committee in their giving him and Robert Fogel the, the Nobel Prize in 1993, said it was for having renewed research in economic history by applying economic theory and quantitative methods in order to explain economic and institutional change. And I know everybody thinks of him as an economic historian, which he clearly was, but to me, Doug was actually a development economist, at least at heart. Here's what he himself said, in retrospect looking back, but here's what he himself said about his career goals. I went to graduate school with the clear intention that what I wanted to do with my life was to improve societies. And the way to do that was to find out what made economies work the way they did or fail to work. Now that to me is amazing. I went to graduate school with the clear intention of not having to get a job. And uh, wasn't super concerned about how economies worked or didn't work. Had, partly from taking classes from Doug and others, I got on the ball a little bit more and managed to have some sort of a career. But to say that day one going into graduate school, Right, I want to sort of tackle the central question in economics. Deirdre McCloskey calls this idea of why are some countries get rich and why do others stay poor. She calls it the central question in economics. Another Nobel laureate, uh, Robert Lucas, said, the consequences for human welfare involved in questions like these are simply staggering. Once one starts to think about them, it is hard to think about anything else. Doug, from the very beginning, started in on the biggest question I think that we have in economics. And to me, it sounds like development, right? Why do some economies work and why do some economies not work? After he won the Nobel Prize, Doug was frequently contacted by governments and by international agencies like the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund to provide advice about development issues, his particular expertise about development issues. He often expressed, I'll be polite and call it dismay, he often expressed dismay at the development advice given by most economists and international institutions. And I'd like to talk about three of Doug's books that sort of illustrate his growth and his evolution of his ideas and his modeling and, and what he believed about how the world worked. And I'd like to give you some basic takeaways that you can sort of remember about like what was Doug North all about and how is it relevant to you. If I was being totally honest, I'd have to admit that the three books I'm going to talk about are the only three books by Doug North that I've actually read. So that's, <laughs> you're lucky I haven't read six of them, right? We might be here a little bit longer. And if I was being super honest, I would say that one book I didn't really read, but I more or less had Doug read it out loud to me in an economic history class. So that one I got sort of as the original 1980s audio book read by the author, right, in person, <laughs> face to face. Okay? So the approach, what I mostly want to concentrate on is sort of mid and later career of, of Doug North, but that would skip over the beginning and some of the stuff that he did that was cited in the Nobel Prize announcement. So I'll spend a few minutes talking about his life and his early work you know, the stuff that, that, that he initially became famous for. So, his name is Cecil. He's got to be old. He was born in 1920. His father was an insurance executive. They lived in Canada, Europe. He traveled around for his job a lot. Doug was educated at an elite level. He went to the Choate School. It's one of those elite East Coast prep academies. He applied and was going to go to Harvard for college, but his family moved to the West Coast, and, and so he didn't want to be that far away from him. So he settled on Cal Berkeley, right, which is not a terrible safety school, right? If you have to 
if you have to settle, that's not, that's not the worst thing ever. When Doug got to Cal Berkeley, though, he was a very indifferent student. He claims to have had a C average. He was a campus radical. He led protests on campus. He was avowed as a Marxist. And he was very much against the Second World War, which is a bizarre, bizarre. It's a very lonely point of view to take at the time, right? Most of his Marxist friends, once, once the Germans started messing with Russia, were very much pro-war. But Doug stuck to his principles and was against the war. So he was an avowed Marxist. <laughs> and he was a campus protester. Ended up going into the merchant marines rather than going into the military service because he said he didn't want to be associated with violence. He didn't want to be responsible for killing anyone. So he spent the war in the merchant marines. Doug has told a couple slightly different stories about how he became an economist. And I'm not really sure. From what I know of Doug, he liked to tell stories and they sort of change from time to time. So, but these are the two stories I could find of his, of his decision to become an economist. The first one, it was boring being at sea, and at sea he sort of contemplated his life, and he decided he wanted, as we saw earlier, to change the world and make it better. And he thought economics was the subject that would get that done. So he decided to be an economics major. The other, the other story that he tells sometimes is that after he got back, he was living with a family where the wife was a professional photographer and the husband was an economics professor. And he was living with them and working with the wife. Her name was Dorothea Lang. She worked for the uh, Farm Security Administration, photographing migrants in California, and is a very famous photographer. And Doug claimed he could have had a career in photography, but at the end of the day, the husband convinced him, and he went to, uh, he went to go to grad school for economics. He actually had a hard time getting into a grad school because of his C grades. Right? So in some sense, grades don't really matter. Right? A C student won the Nobel Prize in economics. So what does it matter? But in the other sense, he could only get into one graduate school, and that was Cal Berkeley, and that was because he'd been an undergraduate there, and his professors wrote him, wrote him good letters. So grades don't matter in the big picture, but sometimes they actually do really matter, matter in the short run. Okay. So Doug got into Berkeley as a, as a provisional student, did great, got straight A's, finished through, and he took his first job at the University of Washington in Seattle, where he stayed for 30 years. Right, he stayed at that job for 30 years before moving to Washington University in St. Louis, where I went to school, and that's where I got to meet him. We used to joke at WashU, we used to joke that maybe he just got confused and, and ended up at the wrong Washington and hadn't realized that he had changed jobs, or maybe he thought WashU was a branch campus of the University of Washington. But for whatever reason, he just, from the point of view of the grad students, we had no idea. He just showed up. And it was like, oh, wow, cool. Wow, these are. Even though, uh, even though Doug was pretty much of a workaholic, he still had a really interesting outside life. As I noted, he was a talented photographer. And you've got to remember, these are the old days, right, of, of complicated cameras, film, dark rooms. It's a lot of work to be a good photographer back then. He owned his own plane and was a pilot. He was a rancher. He owned ranches. He was a devotee of wine. He loved to smoke cigars. He was married twice, and he had three children. Here's his New York Times obituary. Outside the classroom, Professor Morth, I've got to say this correctly because it's hard to say, a diminutive, effervescent bon vivant, indulged his interest in haute cuisine, photography, fast cars, flying his own plane, hunting, fishing, tennis, hiking, and swimming, pursuing some of them into advanced age. Doug died in 2015 at the age of 95 and was extremely active up until, up until the very end. He died of cancer in his family's home up in Michigan. The New York Times obituary goes on to say, at various times he owned two ranches, one was 160 acres in, in rural California. He paid $10 an acre, and he said he got the money from, from playing poker. That's how he got the money for the, for the ranch. So going back to the academics, his first major achievement in academics was co-founding a new approach to economic history, which is called the New Economic History. At the time when Doug started doing economic history, economic history was mostly located in history departments. It was very descriptive. It was very, for want of a better word, historical. And Doug and others, the young guys, introduced more sophisticated economic theory, and they introduced quantitative analysis, statistics, evidence, and things like that. Uh, Doug was very quickly made the co-editor of the Journal of Economic History, which really helps to push your agenda if you're editing the main journal of the field. It's very helpful to get these new kind of articles into print. And it really was described in the literature as, as a revolution. Yeah. As we'll see later on, Doug had a love-hate relationship with standard economic theory. He loved its simplicity. He loved its predictive power. 
But as time went on and on, he became more and more frustrated with the, with the shortcomings of basic neoclassical everyday standard economic theory. That's kind of, to me, what ties together all of the speakers, that all of the people that our speakers are talking about. I know Pete's using the phrase mainline economics, but they're all people who are really good economists that aren't convinced that the basic standard paradigm can really explain the world. And we'll talk about a few of them that we can link together that, that others have talked about as well. So in my opinion, Doug started becoming, a, he'd already fixed economic history, right, by 1965. He started to become a development economist in the early 1970s. He got a grant from the Ford Foundation, he went to Europe for a year, and he got super interested in European economic history. He wrote a couple books. One of them was co-authored with Robert Thomas. It was called The Rise of the Western World. And I want to talk a little bit about that book. It's one of the three that I mentioned. I'm not sneaking, not sneaking a fourth book in on you. It's one of the three that I mentioned before. Here's what Rise of the Western World is about. Okay? Sometimes in climate change, they talk about a hockey stick graph. So this is like the ultimate hockey stick graph. This is per capita income in England, starting in the early 1200s. Poor, poor, 1300s poor, 1400s poor, 1500s poor, century after century, poor, poor, poor. And then around 1800, it takes off. All right. So the what's incumbent on, on a person that wants to explain why did the Western world rise like that, you could draw a similar graph for France, for Germany, for some of, of uh, the northern hemisphere's colonies of Britain as well, the United States, Canada, things like that. Northern hemisphere? The Western hemisphere, excuse me. So why was the world so poor for so long? How was this amazing sustained growth achieved? And a little bit later on, we'll talk about the, the problem that really bothered Doug, and that was, how is it that a relatively small number of countries have achieved this level of economic success, while many other countries have, have failed to do so, even though the path and the knowledge that these initially rich countries used is available to everybody? Right. In a nutshell, North and Thomas had a very simple explanation for the rise of the Western world. And we'll see, remember, we said is the man who wouldn't take yes for an answer, so he's going to end up rejecting this explanation, but let's start with, with this. Okay? Efficient economic organization is the key to growth. The development of an efficient economic organization in Western Europe accounts for the rise of the West. Growth will simply not occur unless existing economic organization is efficient. Individuals must be lured by incentives to undertake socially desirable activities. Some mechanism must be devised to bring private and social rates of return into closer parity. For Doug, it's not, and, and Robert Thomas too, it's not necessarily new inventions, it's not necessarily education, it's not necessarily the discovery of raw materials or natural resources that caused revolution in living standards, that caused that hockey stick grab to take off. It was figuring out how to unleash human creativity in productive ways. We're not, I'm not saying that people in the 13, 14, 15, 1600s weren't creative, right? The idea is that the structure, the institutional structure of the world when they lived didn't reward creativity in things that cause material progress. If you were a super smart person in the 12 or 1300s, you were going to go and not a member of the landed nobility. You were, if you were able, you were going to go into the military or you were going to go into the church. Right? Being an entrepreneur or a business person was not something that was very remunerative. Okay? So the idea here is that in order to get this explosion in living standards and this increase in, in incomes, exponential increase in incomes in the Western world, we have to have some kind of social mechanism, Doug was famous for calling them institutions, we have to have some kind of institution that gets creativity channeled into a use that's socially desirable. Okay. Let me give you an example of this. Okay. Ocean shipping used to be a really difficult thing to do because sailors didn't know in the 15 and 1600s, they didn't really know where they were out in the open ocean. Right? Latitude, which is up and down, right? that wasn't too hard to figure out. They had that measured, but sideways, longitude, was extremely difficult. And it was a problem that took centuries to solve of how to accurately measure longitude. Right? And to know where you are, right, you need two points. You, know, you need to know where you are up and down, and you need to know where you are east and west. Okay? So a lot of ocean shipping that happened in the 15 and 1600s, it happened with luck, a lot of risk, a lot of uncertainty. And obviously that would dampen the, the fervor at which people would try to conduct transoceanic trade because it was a lot more dangerous and it could take a longer time and goods could spoil and things like that. 
So the social return to solving the longitude problem would be really big, right? If we could invent a way that people could, could measure where they are at sea, it would increase incentives, it would lower transactions costs, it would increase incentives for trade, it would make it safer, it would increase the volume of trade, it would be great for society. The problem is if any one person in the 13, 14, 15, 1600s invented this, they really wouldn't be able to make much money on their invention. Right? Because someone could just buy it, get it, look at it, reverse engineer it, right? pirate it. And so there's no mechanism like we in the United Modern World to give patents for new inventions. Right? There was no mechanism like that in, in, the, in the earlier world. Governments sort of recognized this incentive problem and they tried by offering prizes to anyone who could successfully navigate a round trip ocean voyage and keep accurate track of longitude. These prizes got bigger and bigger and they weren't, they weren't cashed in. In 1717, the British government offered a prize that was worth about $3 million in today's, in today's money. And finally, in, 17, in the 1730s, this guy, John Harrison, produced a timepiece, a marine chronometer, right, that was sufficiently accurate and, la and long-lasting enough to keep accurate track of where ships were on marine voyages. So he won the prize, pocketed the money, and North and, and Thomas's point is that if we had mechanisms in place that rewarded innovation, then creative people would channel their efforts towards that innovation. It would get their private returns closer to the social returns, right? Three million is, is a small amount compared to the social return of knowing where you're at, but it's a heck of a lot better than nothing, <laughs> right? So we use a patent system today, and we also use prizes today. Have any of you guys ever heard of the SpaceX prize that was like $10 million for anyone who could launch, privately launch and, and have a, a sh ship go into orbit and come back and land again. So that was a, a recent prize that was, that was won. All right. So the cool idea of this book, The Rise of the Western World, is incentives matter. Right? So you may have heard that before, but institutions that create strong incentives for human creativity to go into things that produce growth are essential for raising living standards. That seems to us familiar, common sense, makes a ton of sense, obvious, but it didn't appear anywhere in the neo standard neoclassical growth model. Right? Robert Solow, another economist who won the Nobel Prize in economics, created the canonical model of how economies grow. Incentives weren't in there. Institutions weren't in there. Uh, anything like that at all. It was just merely accumulate capital and have the population grow. So North was adding something that took a really long time to sink into the growth literature. The part of the book that would bother North after his publication, again, he's the guy that never takes yes and always wants to do better, was it's, the book basically assumed that institutions and property rights would automatically evolve to be efficient. Right? He said, efficient organization is the key, and in the book they sort of talk about, well, it's sort of a contract between the government and the people, and they will find the best and most efficient organization they can find given their constraints, given what cost it takes to come to an agreement, given riskiness and things like that. The idea is whatever situation we might find ourselves in in history, if institutions weren't ideal, it was because improving them was either too expensive or too risky relative to the gains from improvement. And Doug became dissatisfied with that sort of automatic explanation. All right. And here's what he said. So besides, this says both books, because besides Rise of the Western World, he wrote another book with Lance Thomas called Institutional Change in American Economic Growth. These were early, tentative attempts to develop some tools of institutional analysis and apply them to economic theory. Both were still predicated on neoclassical economic theory, and there were too many loose ends that did not make sense, such as the notion that institutions were efficient. Perhaps more serious, it was not possible to explain long-run poor economic performance in a neoclassical framework. Here's kind of the problem that Doug's talking about in a nutshell, about explaining poor economic performance or relatively poor economic performance. Right, this is a graph from the 1870s to the present of different regions of the world. The bottom blue line that starts in the 1950s is Africa, East Asia, and is higher and higher. So the Western offshoots are like Canada, the US, New Zealand, Australia, right, Western Europe. And you can see like Latin America, the green line, the darker green lines, Latin America and the Western offshoots, there was a few thousand dollars per capita between them in 1870, right? They were not materially massively richer. By, by 2016, 
GDP per capita in the Western offshoots is over 50,000. In Latin America, it's 12, 13,000, something like that on average. So if institutions are efficient and they automatically sort of, if the arc of history bends automatically towards efficiency, it's really hard to explain how some regions of the world are doing so well, right, and other regions are lagging behind. Why don't they adopt the same institutions, right? Why don't they, the path is there, the knowledge is there, you can see what's happened in the other countries. Why do we see this lagging of, of some regions of the world or some countries in the world? So that was kind of the problem that Doug, you know, he sort of put himself in this institutions are efficient box, and then he confronts information like this and realizes, wait, so that's not really going to be right. Okay? And Doug started to, to realize or started to believe that the government, that the state, wasn't always a force for efficiency. His next main book was called Structure and Change in Economic History. He decisively abandoned efficient institutions and he tried to abandon neoclassical economics with, with much limited success. Okay? So, Adam Smith, <laughs> right? Okay. Have to have a quote from Adam Smith. Little else is requisite to carry a state to the highest degree of opulence from the lowest barbarism, but peace, easy taxes, and a tolerable administration of justice. All the rest being brought about by the natural course of things. What Doug sort of came to understand is that once the state has a monopoly of force and once the state is collecting taxes, it often seems to go far beyond the Smithian mandate of, of tolerable justice and easy taxes. And it, it, it starts to create innumerable barriers to economic progress. So there's this balancing act. In the Structure and Change books, there's this balancing act at the heart of the book. According to North, if the state is too weak, growth is not really going to be possible because the state can't enforce contracts, it can't enforce property rights, it can't sort of be the referee of, of, of economic activity. But if the state is too strong, growth is going to be a real problem as well because it's going to be confiscatory, it's going to be risky to be an investor, you might get expropriated or nationalized or whatever. We all know this, right? But in the United States, the founding fathers dealt with this issue, strong or weak, right, by directly enumerating the rights of citizens in the Bill of Rights and by developing a system with a lot of checks and balances in it, right, to help enforce the rights that, that, that they gave us. Would-be dictators don't like checks and balances. If you look at recent activity in Venezuela, Bolivia, Ecuador, Nicaragua, right, people come into power, they immediately want to rewrite the Constitution, they want to weaken the legislature, they want to get rid of judicial independence, they want to get rid of term limits, and they want to stay in office as long as they possibly can. Okay, and a lot of these guys also really enjoy expropriating private property, right? nationalizing things. It's not surprising from that point of view that those countries haven't done really well in their leftist phase of, of, of economics. Okay? In his earlier work, Doug had covered change. right? When external circumstances change, cost benefit changes, and people do the best they can under the circumstances here, He's more addressing persistence, right? He wants to say, why do things that clearly are a net positive, why don't they happen? Why don't these poor countries imitate the rich countries and do better? And Doug's answer is that he proposed at this time was that people's belief systems, or what he called ideologies, made them misestimate the trade-off, right? That people had a certain culture, a certain history, a certain set of beliefs that made them look at the trade-offs involved in changing their institutions and incorrectly conclude that it wasn't worth it. Okay, so at this time, his answer for persistence was kind of sort of your mental model, your ideological map, your inability to conduct an objective cost-benefit analysis. Shortly after this book was published, Doug moved from Seattle to St. Louis. That's where I got to know him. I took an economic history class from Doug, which was interesting. He had just finished the Structure and Change book. He would just come into class and start talking about the ideas in the book. He didn't assign any readings. He didn't tell us, read this chapter, we're going to discuss it. And he was very brusque in class. He would ask a question, he would just go, you. And he'd say something, no, you, no, you, no. So I brought the book to class and hid it under the desk and just tried to follow along. And one day he pointed at me, and I just read what was there, something about like the Swedish pikemen and fortifications made medieval knights obsolete, and this made the feudal lords have to be nicer to the peasants. And he's like, Kevin, very good. That's very good. Like all of a sudden, I'd got 100 more IQ points or something. I just had the book hidden under the desk. My grad student buddy, Mike Munger, asked me what my secret was. I told him, so Mike did it. And then the next week, he called on Mike. Mike did the same thing. And North just goes, no, no, and called on somebody else. So Mike was super mad at me about that. Okay. 
Doug's class wasn't the worst class or the weirdest class that we had in grad school. We also had at Washu at the time, does anyone know who this is? Has anyone heard of, a, of the financial fragility hypothesis or a Minsky moment? This is Hyman Minsky, right? The sort of great heterodox monetary economist. We had, if we do the field of monetary theory, which I was, you had to take his class. He held class in his office. We were in the classroom, he goes, oh no, we're going to our office. So like, I'm just like, oh, I'm never going to this class, right? That's crazy. So I in my office, well, he's in his office. He comes and he just walks, knocks on my door. I open the door, he's standing there, he's just like, come. Leads me down the hall. Doug didn't care if we skipped, right? But uh, Minsky did, and he made, it was a rough class. So Doug was not by far the strangest teacher that we had. Doug moving, I think the reason why Doug moved from St. Louis, from Seattle to St. Louis, tells a lot about his character or his, uh, his yeah, his character or his intellectual interest. He wasn't satisfied with structure and change. He didn't like just saying, oh, people make mistakes, and that's why things don't evolve and change. He felt like he needed to know more about politics. He actually says, I looked at departments all across the country for departments where there were good political scientists that worked with economists and liked to use economic tools and settled on WashU. And just sort of, you know, that's not really how you get a job in academics. You don't just pick a school and call them and say, hey, I'm coming. <laughs> get, get an office for me, I'm coming. But Doug was, was able to do that. And at WashU, right, there was Barry Weingast, Art Denzow, uh, Ken Shepsley, Randy Calvert, James Alt, later on Norman Schofield and other people were there and they worked a lot with Doug. It had to have been a lot of pressure on them, you know, to have this sort of eminent guy tell you, I'm kind of stuck, I'm not happy with my explanations, I'm coming here and by golly you guys are going to have to help me out, figure this out. All right, that would, be, that would be tough. But the one person that sort of worked with Doug the most and, and really helped him get further along the road that he wanted to get was Barry Weingast. Barry was my dissertation advisor, one of my dissertation advisors at, at WashU. Barry and uh, Doug together, they wrote a really cool paper about how change occurs and when change can be sustained. And it's about the glorious revolution in England. What happened in the early 1600s, the British crown went from the Tudor family to the Stuart family. And the Stuart family was very independent and very cantankerous and didn't get along with Parliament. At the time, there was a court system, there was a legislature called Parliament. Parliament was supposed to approve all taxes. But the Crown wouldn't give them any concessions, so Parliament wouldn't approve any taxes. So the Crown, the Stuart Crown, had to raise their own money. They did this by what are called forced loans, which is basically stealing. <laughs> they would go to a noble and say, guess what, you're loaning us 10,000 pounds. We'll pay you back in five years at this percent interest, which generally didn't happen if those nobles then took them to court and the court, the judge in court was stupid enough to rule against the crown, the crown just fired the judge and replaced him. So things were going really badly in England at this time, so badly that the parliamentary faction rebelled, the English Civil War in the 1630s. The English Civil War with Oliver Cromwell took over, they won the war, they executed the Stuart King at the time, cut off his head, and formed a commonwealth, a parliamentary commonwealth of England. That went really badly as well. Cromwell died in 1658, and a year later, the Stuarts were back on the throne again, doing exactly the same bad stuff that they had done before, making everybody unhappy with them. And what happened in 1687 and 1688 was that same parliamentary group, absent Cromwell, essentially subcontracted out the crown to William of Orange, to this Dutch nobleman. All right. So they sided with William of Orange, he came in, James II abdicated, the Glorious Revolution, and not only that, there was a Bill of Rights that was put in in 1689 that basically reaffirmed that Parliament was in charge of taxes, that the court should be independent, sort of put checks and balances back into the system. Now that sounds great, right, but I mean, the Parliament back when the Stuarts were running rampant over the rule of law in England did the same thing. They passed a bunch of laws and they were just ignored. All right, so the question then is like, why did these laws stick? This is John Wallace, Doug North, and Barry Weingast, the three people that wrote, that wrote Violence and Social Orders. Right, and what Doug and Barry argue in the book is that these kinds of agreements, constitutional legal agreements, have to be self-enforcing. Right? And the fact that the British populace had executed one king and deposed another king was credible threat that if the, if the current crown got out of line, that there would be serious consequences to them. 
Okay, so they argue that the, the past violence gave the, the parliamentarians and gave the rule of law people sufficient credibility that they were able to, they were able to make this stick. As Doug sort of struggles along this road of trying to explain change over time and trying to get a general theory of why economies sometimes work and sometimes don't work, he also ended up co-founding a second really influential school of thought, and that was called the New Institutional Economics. And the co-founders of this would be Ronald Coase with his papers of the theory of the firm and the problem of social cost, and Oliver Williamson, who wrote a fantastic book in the 70s called Markets and Hierarchies. Both of those gentlemen have also won the Nobel Prize in economics. They sort of worked more at the micro firm industry kind of level, and Doug was at the national economy level. And Bobby, you're talking about Eleanor tomorrow. Tomorrow, Bobby will talk about Eleanor Ostrom, who would be a fourth Nobel Prize winner, who had also put in this group of new institutional economics. So let me just briefly give definitions of institutions. Okay, Doug defines the institution as the humanly devised constraints that structure political, economic, and social interaction. They consist of both informal constraints sanctions, taboos, customs, traditions, codes of conduct, and formal rules, constitutions, laws, and property rights. Doug also makes a distinction between institutions and organizations. So another quote from him, a crucial distinction in the study is made between institutions and organizations. Conceptually, what must be clearly differentiated are the rules from the players, sort of a sports analogy. Okay? The rules are different than the players. The purpose of the rules is to define the way the game is played. But the objective of the team within that set of rules is to win the game by skill, by strategy, by coordination, by fair means, and sometimes by not fair means. Modeling the strategies and skills of the team is a different process from modeling the creation, evolution, and consequences of the rules. I'm going to, the third book I wanted to talk about was called uh, Violence and Social Orders. And just very briefly in that book, it was written with Barry Weingast and with John Wallace, the guy who quote I put up at the beginning when I still had slides. <laughs> with John Wallace, and they argued in the book that the reason why societies were so hard to change is because they weren't primarily organized to promote growth. Societies were primarily organized to solve the problem of violence. Right? That in the sort of primitive world, violence is rampant, it's chaotic, it's unpredictable, and there's really no incentive to try to accumulate property or to try to make yourself better off because you have no way to protect yourself or protect that property. So what Doug and Barry and John call limited access orders are sort of primitive forms of government that come together and are able to be successful because they're able to solve this violence problem and stop violence. And the way they do that, according to them, is they get the different elite groups, the military, the rich, others, they get these groups to agree to sort of come together, stop hurting each other, and collect rents from the non-elites. Right, so these groups get special treatment, different treatment under the law. So Doug put it, they provide a solution to violence by embedding powerful members of society into a coalition of military, political, religious, and economic elites. Elites all possess special privileges, access to valuable resources or activities, and the ability to form organizations. On the other side of the coin, they talk about open access orders, and by this they mean the rich countries, and they basically mean equal access under the law. Who you are doesn't matter. It's the rightness of your case and the brilliance of your mind and how hard you work and so on and so forth. And Doug said the problem, the problem of development was moving countries from limited access to open access. And he was super critical of development economists giving advice where that advice mostly was take the policies that work in the open access countries and start using them now. Have an independent central bank. Right? Have a fancy constitution. And Doug just said that's just completely wrong. right? These limited access states need to just be moved slowly and slowly and slowly to become slightly and slightly more liberal. It might take generations, according to him. And then, once they get close, then we can start putting in those policies. But putting in policies before they've met the sort of preconditions for those policies to work is going to be self-defeating. So here's a great quote from him. If you try to uniformly apply what worked in country A to country B, you're going to get in trouble. It is not going to work the same way because beliefs and institutions are going to be different in each society. Economic advice is so often wrong because it says generalizations can be applied anywhere and they will work. That is simply not true. Okay? And that is, I mean, the World Bank has spent hundreds of billions of dollars giving development advice that says take the obvious policies of rich countries and adopt them into your country. A great example would be the, the 
the World Bank and UNESCO, 100% primary enrollment. What a great, for school children, what a great goal. What an awesome goal to have, right? 100, every kid is getting an education, right? But the problem is, rolling in a primary school is not necessarily getting an education. In a rich country, it kind of is, right? But in a poor country, just being in the school is not really sufficient to get an education. And what these countries did, you sort of get what you paid for. These institutions paid for enrollment, and they got enrollment. They often got enrollment in schools with no teacher, in schools with no chairs, in schools with no roofs. So governments reacted to the incentives of, sure, well, if, you want, if, if our loans and our help from you are going to be predicated on universal enrollment, we'll get everybody enrolled. All right? But it didn't produce the education that was what people really wanted. So Doug was just almost scornful of this idea that that we could just take policies, pop them into a limited access order, and expect them to work. He thought that was crazy. Whenever, in a consulting job, whenever someone approached him in a consulting job, he said, I need six months, at least six months, to like study this country, and he, as he put it, figure out what makes it tick. Now that cracks me up, because Doug did like cigars and good meals and wines and stuff like that, and so he liked to make money. So I could see him telling a country, yeah, you're going to have to pay my hourly rate of consulting for six months, and then we can have a conversation about how I can help, how I can help your country. Okay? So to me, let me just give, close by giving a couple takeaways from you guys about Doug. So Doug North revolutionized economic history by bringing theory and statistics into the field. And ironically, the young Doug made economic history so neoclassical that old Doug, institutional Doug, didn't like it anymore. He was always complaining about how Economic historians were too neoclassical. They didn't have a distinctive point of view. They weren't addressing change over time, which was the big issue. So he had like fights with the field that he created later on in his life. He also co-founded new institutional economics, which stretched the inadequacies of standard neoclassical economics and assisted on the importance of transactions costs, property rights, and institutional arrangements in creating observed economic outcomes. Doug constantly preached what matter was modeling or understanding change over time which he strove to do for 45 years. So that's the story of my old professor, semi-mentor-ish, I guess, <laughs> Doug North. And uh, thanks for listening. I'd be happy to take any questions. Deirdre McCloskey has looked at that hockey stick that you showed us and suggested that North is, what North says about institutions is not quite enough, that there's actually something else going on, right? There's uh, a cultural situation, there's right. a shift in although I think this is very much in the lines of North, I would say norms, right? Mm -hmm. That says there's a bargain that allows entrepreneurs to actually go and um, do what they want to do, right? We'll let you go and make money and we won't bother you, right? right? And you will give us goods and services. And I just wanted to see your take on McCloskey's uh, view on that. She thinks it's very far from North. I, she was down at, at, at Texas Tech last week and I went to lunch with her, and she, she said, oh, you're giving a talk about North, and she just like, mm. <laughs> just kept. But I mean, I, you know, North's point in, in, in the rise of the Western world was, right, we need institutions that, that reward socially productive activities. And if that institution is not looking down on entrepreneurs, you know, Doug emphasized not taking their product from them, right, letting them keep the rewards. Deirdre is emphasizing a culture that, that made entrepreneurs feel good about themselves or made it respectable to be an entrepreneur. And those could be two sides of the same thing as far as I'm concerned. I mean, I think I don't see a big conflict there. They certainly, Deirdre certainly does. Yes. Yeah. You said at the very end uh, that Norris said uh, because beliefs and institutions are different in different locations that you can't really uniformly apply economic policies. And I'm wondering if you would maybe elaborate on that in the context of changes between economic systems and so maybe countries that are going from socialist to capitalist, would you also sure. say you can't uniformly apply changes? It's going to take generations. You can't do it all at once. Right. It's not going to work. Or is that different? No, no. Doug was a very scornful of shock therapy. He was very scornful of the idea you could go from 50 years of socialism, communism, to be a functioning capitalist economy very quickly. Right? He, did, he thought that was just ridiculous. And in fact, he one of his big arguments or beefs with economic historians was, he said, if we were any good, we should have been all over the fall of communism. We should have explained exactly how this would work, exactly what was the right thing to do. But we were so neoclassical, we had nothing to say, right? and it came out as a mess. Right? So Doug would say, it's nuts to take a world where 
you know, the incentives or the skills that you need to succeed in a communist socialist world, like in a really serious communist society, are way different than the skills you need to survive in a capitalist society. And just popping in capitalist institutions is just very counterproductive, according to him. And I think by and large, right, history sort of agrees with that. If you look at the purple line here, that's Eastern Europe. And you can see, now, I'm a relatively cynical person. You can think about how this you want. I'm not entirely sure. I'm a huge fan of the accuracy of Soviet bloc countries' economic statistics. Be that as it may, the purple line is showing growth, not at the rate of the Western offshoots or Western Europe, until, oh, I don't know, 1989? which was the fall of the Berlin Wall and the capitalization of these societies. And then you see that huge dip. That's a huge income loss. All right? That is a huge income loss. And by 2016, they've just barely recovered to where they were. Shock therapy was, in my opinion, bad advice. Right? And to Doug, it's the classic case of thinking things will generalize, that the institutional context doesn't matter, and what works in America will work anywhere else. All right? And he would say, look. Here, we screwed this up badly. I know in the beginning you said how he was very much like a radical Marxist. Yeah. Um, I was just, it kind of seemed like, I don't know, between his undergrad and grad, he just completely switched his viewpoint. I was just wondering, like, what contributed to that switch? Who was like super, you know, just your average uptight economist, right? Just Mr. Marginal Cost, Marginal Benefit Economist. And he said, like, he always beat Gordon in chess, but Gordon taught him economics and converted him to being a neoclassical economist. So he lost sort of his, his radicalism and his Marxism and became neoclassical over, according to him, over a chessboard in Seattle, Washington. And he says, I became like just like a super neoclassical, right? It was like my religion and was like more neoclassical than anyone. And then slowly over time, he got away from that position more and more and more. What do you think would Doug North say about Russia? Uh, would Russian institutions uh emerge at some point, would they stop being extractive and uh, would they uh, help actually lead to economic growth? Starting back in the 1980s or starting from where we are today? Uh, well, what, what would he expect? Or would he expect Russia to actually start um, producing or making or creating some institutions that would, would stop being extractive? I'm not sure what he would say. I think what he would say is that if they do, it's going to take a long time, and that the West's interaction with Russia hasn't been conducive to that evolution starting. All right? They haven't, you know, sort of... Doug was very much about incremental change, right? So I would think Doug would, and I hate to say this, I don't think Doug would be excoriating them about human rights. He'd be trying to nudge them gently towards sharing the wealth of natural resource, towards diversifying their economy, towards expanding property rights and expanding institutions slowly, gradually, not in a grandstanding way or in, a, you know, in an aggressive way, like a lot of current US policy or previous US policy has been towards Russia. So to me, development, Doug, is very much an incrementalist. He once said he thinks that like full transition could take 100 years. All right, so he would be very much in what he thought the international institutions should be doing was slowly taking these limited access orders and just, just nudge them a little bit. Every little bit helps. A thousand nudges will finally get you where you need to be, and then we can talk about independent central banks and judicial independence and things like that. So I think incremental Doug would be unhappy with US policy towards Russia, and he would expect it to take a long time, and he would say that we haven't been very helpful in, that, in encouraging that outcome. We're more interested in making our points than we are in really improving, improving the situation. But you mentioned that people misunderestimate the trade-off in the developing countries. Right. So why, what does Douglas will say about how, how can people change the mindset of the developing countries? Right. So that's, a, and again, a really good question. So and you got to talk, remember to talk about which Doug North you're talking about, right? There's neoclassical Doug in structure and cha in uh, Rise of the Western World. There's People won't change, Doug, in, in structure and change. And there's, it takes 100 years, Doug, in uh, violence and social orders. But in structure and change, he said it was just like the ideologies, and this sort of relates to a little bit of what you're talking about, 
right, that an ideology that doesn't value sort of economic creativity, an ideology that values, say, the military or the church almost exclusively, is an ideology that is going to not really see the benefits that would come from changing your institutional apparatus or institutional structure in a way that would be wealth creating. Right, and he thought that was a hard problem. He thought it would take a really long time to get those kinds of changes. Right. He stopped using the word ideology because it's a very sort of word that people fight about. Being ideological is meant to be a bad thing. So he stopped using that word. He talked about mental models. He talked about path dependence and things like that. But I think Doug was like a, a realist, right? We're so pie in the sky with our, with our development advice and our, our confidence or arrogance about what we think the West can do for poorer countries. Right? The World Bank is just, to me, unbelievable. Right? They've got it wrong for like 50 years and there's not still any humility or any like, oh, sorry, we'll try to do better. It seems like in the genesis of like just his overall changing over all the years, uh, which of his books would you recommend like if you could only recommend one and why? Sure. So Doug said that he thought Structure and Change was his best book. Okay. I disagree with that. He may have said that before 2009. Right? And that's really arrogant to disagree with the author. Right? But, uh, it's fine. I probably don't agree with what Picasso thought was his best painting or something like that. So I would actually recommend the Violence and Social Orders book as the one to read, as being the one that sort of contains all the previous stuff and is sort of sorted through. And even just the memory of this lecture if there is any memory of it, right, would help you to see like, oh, okay, he's doing this because in the past he got attacked for this or something like that. So I would say start at the end. Start with that book. Thank you.